about to hear a revolution in talk radio, Liberty Talk Radio, where the critical thinking will defrag your mind of propaganda-ridden viruses induced by mass media news programming. No BS here, just the facts. And now we present to you America's quintessential iconoclastic anomaly. Wow. In talk radio, your host, Joe Cristiano. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Liberty Talk Radio, America's libertarian voice, broadcasting from our studio in Tulsa, Oklahoma, to around the world. I'm your host, Joe Cristiano, and this is your antidote to popular talk radio. Uh, Folks, it's time for us to take back control of our government now before this bureaucratic, oversized, and self-serving federal government starves us of our property, our freedom, our rights, and our liberty. But to do this, we must shed conventional thinking regarding our political structure. We need to be revolutionaries in thought, dissidents in action. Only after we recognize what our government is doing to our freedom and our Constitution will we start taking it back. And this program is just about that. During our live broadcast, we invite you to call 646 652-4620 652-4620 or 888-773-4496. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to remind our listeners to sus- sus- pardon me, subscribe to our reminder service by visiting our website and clicking on the subscribe icon. For those of you who tweet, our Twitter address is at Liberty Joe. Now on to our show. Folks, we were supposed to start at 8 o'clock this morning. It is now almost 8 to 20. We had some technical problems. We are just getting up. I am going to attempt to call our guest, who was supposed to be on our program this morning, Andy Sutton. And I don't want to disappoint too many people. I'm going to see if I can get him possibly on the line and see if we can get him on the air. Okay, so if you'll be patient with me, I'll try to do that. Let's see, we do, we do have someone listening in, but um, you know, I, I, I certainly do apologize. I really wish uh, this didn't happen. I think what happened is the cleaning people last night probably um, hit some of the wires, disconnected a bunch of things. And uh, hi, Andy. Yeah, uh, we had technical problems, but we're on the air now. Would you like to call in? Okay, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Okay, we're lucky. I got hold of Andy, and he will be on the air in, in a minute. Okay, let's see. Um, what, what's his number? Um, okay, so uh, we, we do hope that we can get Andy on the phone, and uh, let's see. Boy, we have a whole bunch of people here now on the phone. <laughs> we have a whole bunch of listeners. 814, area. I'm looking for 814. Here we go. Andy. Hey. Andy. How you doing, Joe? All right. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a, a, a half a dozen people on the line wait, waiting for you, believe it or not. And um, we are wow. 20 minutes late as it is. Um, and so I apologize. I think what happened is that there are so many wires when the cleaning people come in, you know, they, they vacuum and whatever. I think they hit a few wires and then things came apart because we have everything pretty well secured. And the vacuum cleaner must have hit something very hard. So we had a really, we didn't know what happened. So we were all trying to figure out I had technical people on the line and just trying to get it fixed. Well, I don't want to spend too much time doing that because we don't have much time left. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for being on our show. The title of our, uh, our, our broadcast for after you and I spoke is Crashless or Cashless with, <laughs> with economist Andy Sutton. And folks, that's what we're going to talk about today, our near term, what we expect in, of our economy. And um, um, I guess, Andy, the question is, are, are we going to go crashless or are we going to go cashless? What's your opinion? Well, I, you got six people on the line. Uh, if any of these people want to ask a question before we get started, I mean, I, why don't we why don't we go through that before oh. we get, make them wait a whole half hour or anything <laughs> like that? Okay. Well, I think they're all here listen, waiting to hear from you. But uh, but let me let me invite okay, everyone right. to call. You know, and say please call at any time during the broadcast, oh, even right now. Guys, I thought these guys all hit one. They wanted to talk. Okay, oh no no right. no! They they just we'll waiting to hear from you. All right, we'll go for it, and then, uh, hey, you guys, if you want to chime in, please do. You're not interrupting anything. <laughs> okay. Crashless or cashless? This is this is something Joe and I talked about through email. You know, and, and I'm probably going to say some things that might annoy some people, but I'm, all I'm asking is that people would just listen and 
think about it, and then you make your own decision. Come to your own conclusion. We we've been you know doing this whole you know economic crisis thing here for well since 2008 for sure. Before that, if you were paying attention, uh, we talked about the housing bubble, the credit bubble, subprime mortgages. Derivatives, leverage, you know, these are all household words now for people that are paying attention to this stuff. And <clears throat> there's a lot of folks, and it's, you know, I don't know where this started, but it seemed, I, I don't know if it was on the Austrian side of things. It certainly wasn't on the Keynesian side. They, they think we can just do this nonsense forever. Right. Uh, so it probably started more on the Austrian side of things, people looking at what's going on, and seeing all these distortions that are being caused by, you know, monetary policy and whatnot, and saying, well, th this whole thing's going to crash. And at the time, you know, eight, ten years ago, that might have been a logical conclusion. I'm going to throw something out there, and then I'm going to say a few things. Uh, we have been crashing for the last eight or ten years. But it's not what's been portrayed by... You know, a lot of these folks, and let me tell you something, there are a lot of people today, writers, publishers, there have been there's huge businesses that have been built around the idea of pushing this idea of a crash because it sounds, I don't know, I don't even know what the, I was thinking last night trying to come up with the right word for what it sounds like. It, it's just real, it's kind of cool, but not cool. You know what I mean? Right, it's, I know. kind of like... You know, yeah. Mad, Mad Max, you know, the movies, you know, Instant Chaos, you know, that that whole thing. There's huge businesses that have been built around the idea of pushing this whole crash thing. I see. And, and I'm, not, I'm not sitting here saying that it's impossible that that can't happen. What I'm saying is that it has been happening. You take a look at household incomes. You take a look at, you know, consumer debt loads. You take a look at student debt. You take a look at the situation with Social Security, Medicare, all of these things. We've been crashing. It's a slow motion thing. It's incrementalism, whatever you want to call it. People don't notice it as much. If we went from 2006 to today over the course of three months, I guarantee you everybody would have been noticing there'd be rioting in the streets and, and all the stuff that you've seen over in Europe you know, with some of the situations that are going on over there. But because it happens over eight years, it's not that big of a deal. I'm not convinced that we're going to see this Armageddon-style blowout just because it really doesn't benefit anybody. I mean, yeah, there might be some really sick people, and, and they're granted there are some really sick people, uh, in, you know, in the establishment that, that runs the banking system and, you know, try to, tries their best to control uh, the economies of the world. You're filth of the lowest order, yeah, scum of the earth, yeah, but they're greedy too, and they want it all. And if they blow this whole thing up here, especially in America, they're not going to get it all. They, uh, my opinion is, they want debt servitude, which they're getting. They want more control, which they're getting, but they're getting it, and we're giving it to them right now. If they have to take it, that's going to cost them something. So why would they do that when we're willing to give it to them? They just have to be a little bit patient. Now, will their patience run out possibly? They just say the heck with it? Possibly. Will the American people finally wake up and say, you know what, we've had enough. We're not going to give this away anymore. And you're going to have to take it? That's possible too. But I think that's probably, you know, you look at history. Probably there's only one or two examples of exceptions. You know, the American Revolution being a big one, and that's, I think, one of the reasons why it gets uh, distorted, poo-pooed, you know, and, and, and spun so much, you know, for school kids in history classes and stuff like that, because they really don't want people to know what that was all about. Right. Because it is one of the notable exceptions in history when people actually did not lay over and just show their belly. Right. They showed their teeth. Yeah. You know, and the, my thing is, like I said, there are... And I, I heard something, this was about maybe about a month ago, that one of the publishers that, that does these, you know, they, they do a, a litany of newsletters that they, they publish 
from all kinds of different authors, and they put a lot of these videos out on the internet. They did. You're gonna, not going to believe this. It was a mid eight figure business in 2014. Mid- it's a big business. This whole, you know, things are going to crash. You know, these yeah. these predictions. Most of them didn't come true. Most of them haven't happened. Or they certainly didn't happen in the time frame. It's very hard to predict the time frame for any of this stuff. And that's why I don't do it. Because when you do it and you're wrong, even if you're right in the long run, you still lose credibility. Right. But these guys did a huge, these guys are doing a huge business. They're wholly invested in this idea that this has to crash. And what happens is, you know, and, and if, you know, if somebody's in there doing it, and they believe in what they're saying, and, and they, they, they're, you know, that, hey, you know what, tell your, tell your piece, and, hey, you know, people will decide whatever the situation is. But the, my problem with this whole thing is, especially for these guys who are just profiteering off of it, they really don't care one way or the other. They just want the money. Right. What, what they're doing is, now say some guy, you know, is sitting out, you know, it's Friday night, and he doesn't have much going on, and, and he gets on the Internet, and he sees a couple of these videos, and, oh, my gosh, you know, I didn't know this was going on. All right, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start paying attention, you know, maybe, maybe he subscribes to a couple of things, whatever. And he gets beaten, and I, I've had people tell me this. He gets beaten for three, four, five years, you know, with this constant crisis, persistent yeah. crash mentality. Right. After a while, he gets exhausted. Yeah. That's just, true. You yeah. know, I've been waiting for this. I've been waiting for this. Right. It hasn't happened. It hasn't happened. Well, it's going to happen, but it hasn't happened. And you know what he does? He turns it off, and he goes back to doing what he was doing before. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. So they've done a disservice. Right. No. Like I said, it may it may happen. My, my, my thing is just I think people need to accept the possibility or at least consider the possibility that Hey, this is already been, this is already going on, you know that that we can easily document. Yeah. And and this this is a much more profitable avenue for the establishment to take than an all-out crash. Right. The Chinese don't want an all-out crash. The rest of the BRICS don't want an all-out crash. We certainly don't want one. The Europeans don't want one, although I think they might get one anyway, yeah. <laughs> or at least a partial one. Right. Now, now that now, let me also say that is not to say that along the the whole pathway here, you're not going to see more things like 2008. I think you will. That's not what I'm talking about. You know, 1987s, your 2000s, your your bubbles, your right. housing. You know, when you do these types of things, you blow up lots of bubbles. I'm not saying that we're not going to have another 2008. I think we will. I'm talking about the total. You know, meltdown, you know, people, uh, you know, playing Mad Max beyond Thunderdome, you know, out in the streets of America. That's what I don't think we're going to see. I was, you know, I was I was just waiting for this to happen so I could buy one of those crazy cars and ride around in the desert. You just, you just destroyed all my dreams, you know yeah, that? You know, you know that? Hey, you know what? You buy yourself the car and go ride around. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now let me ask you this: this you know, grow, grow your hair real long. <laughs> I have no hair. Get a club. Get, I have no hair. A club. <laughs> yeah, you need both. <laughs> you know, I'm like Mr. Wonderful on the on the Shark Tank. You know, <laughs> I look like him, but <laughs> but he's a lot better looking than I am. But the um, what about the the bubbles seem to be getting bigger. Uh, more and and uh, uh, more perverse. Uh, are we not getting to a point where the credit default swaps, the naked short selling, the, um, the 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 dark rooms that are doing all of the trading, the um, uh, foreign entities that are hiding behind these shell corporations that are looking to bring down the United States, and they all have their reasons. Um, or, or some other market for that for whatever reason it is, but mostly the, the United States market, which is what they contributed to, to. They contributed to the 2008 crash, for example, the people in the Middle East. I mean, you have, and I can go on for maybe a half hour with all these little things. Um, uh, and, and then the notional value of derivatives being in the quadrillion dollar 
uh, range now. Aren't all of these money managers, they're one big party, they're all sitting there having a great time, and there's one door out, and the door is slightly ajar, and although it seems like they're all having a good time and everything is fine, every single one of them has one eye on that door. And the second someone leaves to go to the men's room, you know, they know that's the cue and the place empties out. And that's the crash. And could the crash not be to a magnitude so much higher or stronger than it was in the past that it precludes all of this, you know, just downturn where the downturn is so dramatic with so much money lost that you can't recover, thus you have a true crash. Is, is that scenario still, you think, very far or remote, or you think that's, are we closer to that? Here's the thing, and I'm going to tell you what prompted me to mention this to you when we emailed the other day. I, I'm sure you've been paying attention to what's been going on you know, when the Swiss franc got decoupled yes. from the euro. Yes, perfect timing for the just, Swiss. Just, just the, <laughs> yeah, right, right. And I, I've actually got a piece here that I'm going to release today, and it kind of, you know, hypothetically connects that event to this whole, you know, European Union a couple of months ago coming out and telling its member nations to draft legislation for the bail-in. Yeah. It, it seems like too much of a coincidence. But here's the thing. Did you did you see some of the moves in the franc and in, in the different currencies after that happened? I mean, they oh, were it was phenomenal. Like, I mean, it was it was unprecedented. It was 30, yeah, it was, like, it was like thirty percent. Oh yeah, in one day. Yeah. Well, you look at all these derivatives. Now, granted, they're all not Swiss franc derivatives. There's derivatives for everything under the sun. There's probably derivatives uh, based on whether your coffee pot. Makes the right amount of cups. <laughs> That's right. In the morning. I, I'm, I'm, I mean, you're, no, you're right. No, I'm, I'm laughing, but you're right. You're absolutely correct. Yeah. <laughs> now, they have weather derivatives. Right. Uh, I mean, there's derivatives for the Super Bowl. I mean, literally, they, you can bet. It's a casino. You, and you're right. It's a casino. You can bet on anything. What I found to be interesting is that we had a 30% move in one day in the Swiss franc, and it didn't take anybody down. Right. Yeah, a couple of these little guys on the fringes, you know, got burned. Yeah. Nobody big. There was no rumble. And I was mm -hmm. really expecting there to be a rumble. Yeah. Now, were all these guys, you know, forewarned and had they eased out of their their their, their Swiss franc, you know, derivative obligations? That'll come out later. Right. Yeah, we'll learn you about know, that soon. There's a possibility that that's the case. Yeah, you know, that whole that whole thing is where somebody gets too greedy, and yeah, like you said, everybody hits the door. I'm not saying that this can't happen. I'm just saying we have to, you know, look at the possibility that we're not going to that it's just going to keep being a slow burn. That is one of the things that could upset the apple cart. Right. That whole derivatives pile. Just because of the fact, just because it's so big. Now they've gotten really good, and when I say they, I mean central banks. You know, not not just ours, all of them, especially the Europeans, with uh, you know all the stuff that went on there over the past four or five years. You know, with the bonds and the, the debt and everything that's going on in Europe and is still going on, and they haven't had, you know, they've had some some minor bank failures. They have not had a major bank go down. They've had a few get in trouble. But they've kept the lid on it, which is also surprising. Now, I'm going to argue against myself. That also plays into the idea that, yeah, eventually what's going to happen is there's going to be complacency. They're going to think, well, we can handle anything, and they're going to get complacent, and then they're going to get burnt. Right. So, you know, it, this is, it, it, it's, I think people just need to consider, and by doing that, I think it'll make it easier for people to manage the stress that's involved with paying attention to all this. You can't be at DEF CON 5 24-7, 365 right. yeah. for 5, 10, 15 years. Right. You're going to go nuts. That's, that's, that's correct. I, 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 are, are you familiar with Kevin Freeman? Who, um, he was uh, an associate of, um, of Sir John Templeton. He wrote his uh, business plans and he was in um, he worked for him, 
And uh, I personally know Kevin Freeman from way back. I haven't seen him in about 15 years or 10 years. Uh, he wrote a book, Secret Weapons. And what he talks about is that we should not only look at the financial crisis as a monetary crisis, but as a, a political crisis, um, a, a, a foreign entity, um, an anti-U.S. hegemony type of crisis where other countries are waiting just for the right time, you know, to in fact bring down the system. They don't care about the derivatives. They want to bring down the system because it behooves them in the long run and it improves their position to have a weaker, um, at least military, U.S. US and less intervention. And a lot of this has to do with, you know, a political, not only political, but religious ideology and whatever. And he makes a very strong case for that. Do you think an, an, uh, any of that has, has its place? Well, you know, it does. I mean, there's, there's certainly, you know, and a lot of it's our own doing. You know, Ron Paul talked an awful lot about right. how we bring a lot of our misery to our own doorstep. Yeah. And I think he's right. You know, we've, we've you know, basically trampled the world, you know, from North Pole to South Pole, conquering and so forth. And you talked about this at great length, and I 100% agree with you. And that, that is true. You have to well, you have to weigh that again when when you're considering this, you know, as, as Joe, you know, individual American citizen, or you know, not not to use your name. <laughs> uh, you know, the average person needs to think. All right, so we're gonna, you know, we know we know these people don't like us. We know the Russians don't like us. We know the Chinese don't like us. But we also look at, you know, especially the Chinese. We, you know, they're a popular example for this. If if this you know, say, say this big crash happens. They're going to lose a lot. Will they come out of it better than we? Yes, they will. But they're still going to lose a lot. See, the thing is, these guys are all greedy, too. Oh, yeah, right. They, they don't want to lose it. The, you know, and they, the they want, see, what they want to do is they want to get as much, they want to extract as much as they can. They want to get as much blood out of the American stone as they can. You know, and then they, I don't think they have any qualms then about pulling the rug out from under us. What I'm thinking is, what's going to happen here? And this is just, you know, Andy's two cents opinion. We'll see this more, you know, this ebb and flow kind of thing with a general downward direction. You know, and when we do quote unquote crash, it's going to be from a point that's so close to the ground. It's it's not going to be, you know, the, it might be like a 2008 style, and then we're done. Right. But there's got to be some it. big losers in that. I mean, the next time there's got to be well, there's, some. Oh, really there's going to be. There's going to be. Yeah. There's already been losers. And, and, the, and the company. Look at, the gov government can't bail out again because uh, they, no, they, 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 no. they've they've issued already tr uh, unknown trillions of dollars. I mean, would, uh, are they going to go into the quadrillion dollar um, a bailout range? I mean, it's it's getting to a point where the numbers are so incredibly large. It's like saying, let's not go to the, to the moon. Let's go to Pluto. I mean, it's it's beyond, <laughs> you know, it's just beyond our capability to do so. No, I no, I agree with you. I mean, and it and I think they realized after 2008, you know, after passing TARP and then you know having Paulson do the shuck and jive and turn around and hand the money to the banks, I think they realized that they might have used up their one card. I think they could get away with it again on a small scale. I don't think they could get away with it again on a large scale. This is one of the reasons why, you know, instead of the bailout, why they turn to the bail-in. Right, right. Basically, throwing the risk from population at large to throwing the, popu the risk onto the population or, the, you know, the subgroup of the population that, that happens to be doing business at a particular institution when it goes kaboom. Right. Right. It, it is, you know, and it is, this is was the point of this article that's coming out today, and I, I hope everybody will take a look at it. First of all, it tells you why, what exactly has to happen to cause an institution to need a bail-in. You know, there was a couple of people that have written in and said they didn't really understand, you know, the kinds of activities there. So there's, like, there's a couple examples there. Of, of things that happen to cause that, but that I think is one of the reasons why 
they decided to do that. First of all, you know, it's a, it's a further consolidation of wealth. You know, and you, you want to know who the losers are? Well, you know, look in the mirror. You know, you, me, you know, our kids, you know, that that sort of thing. That Those are the losers. Right. You look at a firm like J.P. Morgan. They go on often and after a quarter ends. It's been quite a few times where they'll say, we, we, you know, we ran the table for the whole quarter. We didn't have one losing day out of 90. None of these guys are losing money. Well, somebody has to be losing money. That's right. It doesn't work. It doesn't, you know, it's not one of those things where everybody can win right. all the time. There has to be a loser on every trade. There's a winner, there's a loser, unless it's a wash. And if it's a wash, nobody's making money. That's right. These guys are all making That's money, correct. and they're all winning. So either they're lying, some of them are lying, or else there's losers that they're not talking about. I'm not making any money. I guess they're taking it from me. <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah, okay. They're all losers. L- at least I know I'm making a contribution to somebody. <laughs> yeah, there you go. But this, I, I just, I hope that people are willing to consider, you know, this, this whole, you know, crash situation. Yeah, you could have, you know, this oil thing right now. That's another big thing. You know all the derivatives that are based on commodities. Right. You know, the volatility in oil prices, that should have caused somebody some trouble. Right. You know, unless, they're, unless they all knew about it in advance, which is entirely possible. But even there, somebody still lost. That's right. Even if they all knew about it six months in advance and had a chance to unwind, somebody still had to lose. Right. So, and this is another thing. You know, we're trying to put this whole puzzle, if you will, together. I think this was the analogy I used in the email. We only have, if we have, if we have a quarter of the pieces, we're lucky. And sometimes you get a piece, and it, and, it, and it's it's a red herring. It's yeah. not a, it's not actually something that's pertinent. Yeah. So you know, we're kind of handicapped, all of us. Right. There's just too much in the shadows. So analyze these things. Yeah. Yeah. And try and figure out what's going on. What people need, and I think this is the take-home of the whole spiel here that I've been spewing for the last 20 minutes. These are all opinions. You know, the That's videos right. that you see on the Internet, they're opinions. What right. you're hearing right now is an opinion. Right. <clears throat> what everybody has to do on their own, you don't just, it's not like, you know, the crowd that watches CNN and says, oh, you know, the little, the little stuffed shirt said this, so I'm going to clap like a little seal right. and, <laughs> and, and waddle in a circle like happy feet and just believe what that person's saying. Right. You know, I want, well, you're, you've got a lot of opinions that are flying around here. Right. Take those opinions, look at the circumstances, and then decide what you're going to do or not do right. about it. And do it in a way that you don't make yourself nuts. Because that's not why, I know that's not why I'm doing this. I'm not trying to make anybody crazy. I'm trying to help make sense out of this in some way. Right. Not, I, not trying to cause people stress. Yeah. Andy, we've got to stop so, for a, just take a quick break, excuse me, quick break um, uh, for our commercial It'll just take a, a, a minute, and we'll be back. And, folks, we have Andy Sutton, economist from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, educating us on how we should think about our economic malaise that we are going through or economic situation, depending on how you look at it. And uh, we, do, we have several people uh, listening in. We're on the board. Please feel free to call and interrupt any time. Andy's here to answer your questions and your concerns. Okay? Press one. <laughs> Press one, please. Okay, just hold on. Press Let's one. <laughs> hold on, we'll go to commercial and we'll be right back. You're listening to Liberty Talk Radio. Political talk derived from a historical perspective. Not always palatable, but good food for thought. Pure libertarian talk with host Joe Cristiano. LibertyTalkRadio.com. Express Test is your go-to company for on-site occupational health testing services. That's right. We said on-site. That means we will meet you at your facility for a free health and occupational safety consultation. Express Test specializes in hearing conservation, respiratory protection, and employee safety. We can help you establish viable programs tailored to your business and employee needs. For your free consultation, call 918-743-2929 or visit us at expresstest.com. That's 918-743-2929 or expresstest.com. 
Do you find yourself asking, what did you say? Aaron Cristiano of Ranch Acres Audiology has over 25 years of experience helping patients just like you. Hearing requires conservation. We need to be aware and we need to be responsible for our own hearing health. Understand more with a little help from Ranch Acres Audiology. Call 918-749-7711. That's 918-749-7711 to learn more. We'd like to thank attorney Constance Squires for her support of Liberty Talk Radio. If you want a comprehensive way to affordably avoid legal issues, call Constance Squires. For a free consultation, call 918-254-9283 or go online at isthywilldone.com. This isn't your typical talk radio show. This is Liberty, Liberty Talk Radio. Folks, we're back. This is Joe Cristiano. You're listening to Liberty Talk Radio. Our guest this, uh, this morning is Andy Sutton, e- economist from the uh, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, regular guest on our show about once a month. And we enjoy his take on what's going on and educates us on uh, economic issues, how they affect us, and helps us think on how we should protect ourselves and our investments and our, our way of living, basically. Uh, Andy, um, what if if I was the average Joe Blow and was not as involved as I am in this subject that we're discussing here today? Um, I wouldn't know what to do. I mean, I would say, "Oh my God, what do I do?" If I'm the average Joe Blow that maybe maybe puts some money in the bank because I think it's the right thing to do, uh, maybe has a four hundred one k which I contribute to very lightly because I I don't have that much cash. I don't have a great net worth, if any at all. I do have bills. I do have uh, uh, student loans or credit card loans or a mortgage and maybe a, you know, 10-year car loan today. You know, wh- when they listen, um, uh, should they not jump off a bridge at this point? No. No? Okay. No, no. All right. Just want to know. <laughs> Just want to see if we, people jumping will know it's because of this program, you know. Well... <laughs> <laughs> and this is the, this is the thing, you know, and what, what we've been trying to, you know, push, if you will, is that people become their own advocates. Right. And you know, I'm going to use the example of of your vehicle. You don't have to become a mechanic. What you need to do, though, you know, you need to understand enough about your car to know if you're being shuck and jived by the garage. Right. You know, if they say, hey, you need four new tires, you need to be able to look at your tires and say, okay, yeah, they're bald. They're balder than Andy and Joe's heads. Yeah, okay, I need <laughs> new tires. <clears throat> or you need to be able to look at your tires and say, hey, you know what? Uh, I still got, you know, eight thirty seconds of an inch here, and that's well above the, the minimum and all that. I think it can wait a few months. Yeah. You know, you, you need to have that basic, you know, at some point you're going to have to trust somebody. Right. But you need to have enough of an awareness, I should say. Not not necessarily intricate knowledge, but enough of an awareness to know if somebody's shipping you a bill of goods or not. And that that's what people need to do with regards to, you know, all of that. And the thing is, you know, you take financial, just basic financial activities that were not dangerous 10 years ago are now. For, exa- for example, was, I, for example, keeping money in a bank. Okay. That was not dangerous 10 years ago. Now it's dangerous. Now, now it can be lethal. Keeping money in a brokerage account. Ask your old Salente. Right. Big name. Big, you know, big guy in, the, in, in this whole thing, right? Yeah, he got taken. You know, I'm, not pick, I'm, not, I'm not picking on Joe. He knew the risk. Yeah. You know, and he, he, was, you know, he was doing his thing, whatever. But... Keeping money in a brokerage account. Ten years ago, you didn't really have to worry about that so much. Now, all of a sudden, you got to keep an eye on what your broker's doing because, you know, if they go MF Global, you're going to the poorhouse. That's right. So, you know, logic says, all right, well, you know, I've got to keep an eye on the bank. I got to keep an eye. I mean, I'll, all right, I got, um, you know, hundred thousand dollars, whatever. Maybe it's not safe to keep it all in one place. Right. Maybe I ought to spread it out some. You know, if one of them has a problem. You know, at least you know the rest of my funds, in theory, at least aren't aren't affected. People, that that's the kind of thinking 
that people need to be doing. And it's the basic stuff. You know, you wouldn't think that a bank deposit would be a problem because we have this myth that there's an FDIC out there and that they have all this money and they can back us up. Right. Yeah. Let's say let's say that you know that the last half hour here has been for naught and tomorrow the franc goes down 60% or up 60% or whatever and it takes out three big banks and you know they <clears throat> they do the whole you know confiscation of you know they do the bail in. Let's say they do the bail in here in the US. You think the FDIC is going to be able to back you know, over a trillion dollars in bank deposits and checkable bank deposits with, you know, forty-two billion dollars worth of a reserve fund. Right. Even if they wanted to, they couldn't do it. Yeah, it's only a very small percentage of what what is actually out there. The thing is, with the bail-in, now they don't have to, because you're not a depositor anymore. You're an unsecured creditor. You're a bondholder. When you put your paycheck in a bank, you're it's this it is the exact equivalent. If you go on to that bank and say, here's my paycheck, I want to buy bonds in your bank. I want to become a creditor to this bank. And that's hard for a lot of people to yeah. get their head around. Yeah. You know, strange so you've, you've is, it, is that I, I really yeah, have you've a, assumed You've assumed risk that has not been disclosed to you. This right. is criminal activity. Right. This is what we're doing. The same thing goes, you know, for you stick money in a brokerage account. That brokerage goes under, you're going to lose, and guess what? The courts have backed this up. This is not a hypothetical thing. You know, that sentinel thing, that, that's gone through the court system, and they said, yeah, it's okay to do that. You don't have recourse. There's case law now that, that supports the idea that, you know, they can, they can play casino and put the little funny hat on and, and spin the cards and all this nonsense, and when they lose, they can clean you out you know, it's like you're sitting at the craps table at the casino, and you lose your shirt, and you reach over to the guy that's over at the roulette wheel and pick his pocket. That's right. Well, people think that they, they, when they have a 401k plan and they have mutual funds and all that, it's in their name. It's not in their name. They have it's an account not, with no. that company. The, the, the funds are in the name of the, uh, of, of the financial institution. I mean, the, the yeah, brokerage they call it, they call it. Yeah, they call it street name. The street name. Right? So and the, street the, art name, right. the article that I'm putting out today talks about that whole scenario, too. Yeah. And there is a way that you can, you can divorce yourself from that. Uh, you can, and it talks about how to do that in there. Okay. And I, I, it's something else. It's called direct registration. It's, what, it's, it's the way we used to do it. You know, when you get the paper certificate? Right. Yeah. Basically, what happens is, in, in you know, since we're talking about it, I'm not going to hold back on people. Uh, direct registration is you say to, to your broker, you know, E-Trade, G-Trade, whatever, uh, I want to take this position. I have a 1,000 shares of XYZ or whatever, and I want to have that come out of your brokerage, go to the company's transfer agent, who's probably going to be a bank, but... Nevertheless, I want it to go there, and, I, and, and it, it, it's going to live there in my name. And some companies will still issue you a paper certificate, which you have to pay for. Yeah. You know, it doesn't come free. Uh, you know, so if you're trading your account, it's probably not a good idea to go DRS. But if you're, you, know, you have positions that you've had for a long time and you want to hold them and you've decided that you're willing to commit those funds those positions to you know the risks of this system you know, that's fine then you have an avenue for taking those assets and bringing them a step closer to you the problem is if it's an ira you really can't do that right well direct so uh, direct is, direct reinvestment programs typically you have the option well they're in your name if it's a direct reinvestment yeah. program yeah, if it's directly the with the company yeah. and you have an option of having them hold a certificate so they can give you the certificates but that's generally yeah. safe we have someone on the line that's been holding for some time to ask you a question you want to take that call now absolutely okay here we go caller you're on the line your question for andy please hello andy joe how you doing fine hey how's it going yeah, I've been listening this morning on my uh, modern-day transistor radio, <laughs> uh, which is my cell phone, and I've got it. I've, I've got it tuned into the uh, the app 
Joe has on the line. And, boy, I tell you, it comes in clear as a bell, guys. Well, great. Hey, Good. Um, Good. Thank you. I, I had a question um, uh, about that those deposits. You know, uh, you just mentioned uh, the banks. You know, it's like buying a bond in the bank. Um, the Did that happen in that last uh, go-around when uh, Obama was going to bail everybody out? Is that when the uh, – or he's going to fix the banks and he, you know – allowed them now to charge you $35 for a bounce check and, and all that stuff. Was that in that round of legislation? That's number this, one. This number actually, two. The idea oh. was actually introduced in the Dodd-Frank bill back in 2010. And there was further... That's the one, yeah. Yeah, there was a further revelation. Yeah, Consumer Protection Act. Go figure. They always do, <laughs> oh, that they always do that. <laughs> <laughs> Any, anytime the government says you're being protected by some piece of legislation, you better read it. Um, <laughs> what, did Reagan, what, did, what did Reagan say? He, he said the, the seven worst words or something like that. Uh, oh, yeah, the government's here to help you. Oh, yeah. I'm from the government, I want to help you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he, well and, anyway... What happened after that, just to finish that that uh, that bit, is oh, mm -hmm. you know, they passed the bill, and then at the end of 2012, uh, there was a couple of white papers that came out. One was co-written by the FDIC and the Bank of England, and they further outlined how this whole thing was going to work. And that's really where, you know, the the Dodd Frank thing kind of it was. You could kind of infer that the bail-in was going to be in place. <laughs> But it yep. didn't right, it real, didn't really come right out and say it. The white papers that the Bank of International Settlements and FDIC and Bank of England put out, they came right out and spelled it out for you, how, how the whole thing was going to work. Well, now the question it begs for me is, uh, your credit unions, are they under the same uh, situation? Well, here's the thing, and I, I will tell you, you know, myself, my opinion on this is, the, the credit unions are slightly better situated. The reason for that is, and if you take a look at the article that's coming out today, it'll make a little bit more. It'll, hopefully, it'll make a lot more sense. Now, is that the on your? Is that on your uh, uh, blog, Andy? Yeah, it'll be on my blog probably within okay. the next hour or so. Uh, cool. The credit unions are not allowed to do many of the things that result in banks getting into this kind of trouble. They don't run dealer operations you know they're they're kind of credit unions are kind of still under the glass steagall paradigm if you will they the old school. Yeah, yeah they just they don't they don't have i mean you can go there and and say hey i want to i want to open an ira and they can get that done for you but they don't do it themselves you know that that's that's farmed out to you know whoever they happen to deal with uh, you know the same risks apply you know to that ira but the credit union itself is not out there making markets in different securities. And by doing that, I mean offering securities for sale. They're not writing options. You know, they're not doing those types of things. So they're, you know, they're kind of like a, uh, a, an insurance company would be the difference between a stock company and a mutual company. They're more like a mutual. They are there to help the depositors or what? Well, That's credit unions, example. first off, they're member-owned. Uh, which is a, is a step in the right direction. They don't do as much of the, like, you look back at 2008, I mean, who, who took the TARP money? There was very, few, comparatively, very few credit unions that took TARP money. There were a couple, but it was mostly the commercial banks because they swim in those, in those waters. The credit unions don't because, you know, they're hamstrung by, you know, some of the rules that, the, that they're under, that they fall under, that they, you know, they don't do the derivatives thing. And that, that's, so that's where you don't want your institution. You don't want them messing around with that kind of stuff. So are they 100% safe? No. You know, any, anything, <coughs> excuse me, any, any institution, you know, if we had a situation like took place over there in Cyprus, you know, they, they could be closed down just as easily as, you know, the commercial bank up the street from them. Comparatively, you know, under a normal operating, you know, scenario, especially now, you know, with all this volatility going on, you know, that claims a commercial bank, say, say it claims, you know, one of the big guys, you know, they're going to shut those branches down, and, you know, if you have money in those branches, you're going to be out. Yeah. So, you know, with a credit union, you don't, you don't have to worry as much 
about that sort of thing. Um, so, you know, it's a step in the right direction. It's, a sa- it's just a safer way to do your personal banking and that type of thing. Maybe yeah, you have a little right, time to get something out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and now I'm going to tell you this, too, because you need to know this. Most credit unions, you go there and you say, hey, I, I, I want $5,000 in cash. You're going to wait a week. Oh. It's like that everywhere because the thing is they get they have to, you know, they use the same currency as, you know, you know Bank ABC down the street that's playing in the derivative pool. They have to put in requests for it. They have rules on that are on them about how much cash they're allowed to keep <laughs> on site. So, you know, they impose the same kind of rules on their depositors that the commercial banks do. You know, I had somebody email me, I don't know, last year, like maybe October, November. They went into a credit union and asked for two grand and were told they had to wait a week. <laughs> two thousand so, dollars. Oh I mean, my god. You know, that, you know, yeah. I could I could get that much for my brother tomorrow. <laughs> right. Hey, you can right. go to a Shylock if you're willing to pay six for five on a weekly basis. You know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And Joe, are you collecting for them again? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I was in the business. <laughs> uh, I remember you told that story. You used to collect. Yeah, my uncle Louie yeah. was in that business, you know. He was uh, he was a he was a financial he was in finance, if you will. <laughs> I'll put it nicely. <laughs> customer service. You know? That's right. He was a customer. Well, thanks, service. guys. I appreciate that. Hey. I just had that question, and I I I feel you know well maybe I'll get out of my regular bank and just do a a credit union, but you know I don't do that much banking now anyway uh, through my bank. I just I have my own bank, so. Well, there you I like go. I like to roll that way. Let's put it that way. Okay. Uh, hey, forward. you know what? That, out of all of them, that's probably your best bet. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Look, at, look at it this way. It's not like you're giving up a trainload of interest to do it. No, that's true. That's right. <laughs> that's right. And this is this is what I've been trying to tell people. And you know, it's not to, you know, incite runs on the banks and all this kind of stuff. It's to incite some critical thinking. If you're not being given any incentive whatsoever to take this risk on that you're not even being told about once you find out that you're taking on this risk just by having your paycheck direct deposited it might make a little bit of sense to decouple from that situation you know it just it doesn't make sense why would you keep your your money at risk like that and then you know if they were paying 10 percent interest all right well you're taking a risk you're getting a return okay well that that that's at least somewhat fair but this i mean <laughs> You know, you're taking the risk and you're getting nothing. You're getting peanuts, yeah. half percent, yeah. nothing. Well, you know, there's an old saying, you know, there's a three G's, God, gold, and guns. <laughs> That's yeah, the way really. you protect yourself. You know, you hear it. You hear that. Uh, you're hearing that more often, in fact. Um, uh, Andy, what 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 does the, really the person do today, though? I mean, uh, um, it's it's the most. Unset- I know I feel unsettled, and I've been in this business, not in the business like you have, but been involved in investing and in and currencies and whatever for 20 years I've been doing this back and forth and uh, almost studying it on a daily basis. And quite frankly, I don't think I'm any, any further ahead than I was 20 years ago in truly having a, um, um, a sense I mean, I know where I, I sort of know where I am, and I've done okay, but I don't have a good sense of where to go next. I, and and I, I guess if I'm confused, I would imagine the average person who's you know more concerned about the kids' little league and and keeping their job and and getting the lawn mowed and stuff like that, things that I don't have to worry about anymore. These people have to be infinitely more concerned than I am, or if they're not concerned, they're not because they don't know what to do. So they avoid it, they ignore it. You know, like, I, you know, maybe if I ignore it, it'll go away and everything will be fine. But what do we do? Well, I think that, you know, the answer to that is it's, it's the same as it was when we, you know, we first started doing this years ago. You, you have, first of all, you got to, you know, like I said earlier, not to sound like a broken record, you got to be your own advocate, first of all, which means you have to understand enough to have an awareness <clears throat> you don't necessarily need to know what a capital ratio is for example but you need to know that okay these guys can do things that can get me in trouble and the government sanctioned this 
they've said it's okay for them to do that. They've said it's okay for the bank not only to leverage itself, but to leverage me also. And they've said it's okay for that bank to take my money if things go bad. Now, how am I going to deal with that? Yeah. That, that's the kind. That's that's the kind of level of awareness, of awareness right. that the average person needs to have. You know, like the caller just said. Well, maybe I'm going to do something a little bit differently. He does do things a little bit differently. He's made a decision after considering, you know, the information available that is going to work for him. That's what people need to do. First off, become more aware. You know, I understand. Hey, life's hard. There's a lot of stress. People are worried about jobs kids, families, whatever, bills. But you have to set aside a little bit of time, even if it's an hour a week, to, to try to keep up with what's going on. Yeah. Secondly, same thing applies as it always applies. Look at the goal of what this establishment is trying to do. Neo-feudalism. They've come out and said it. I've heard more and more of think tank type people talking about neo-feudalism, a return to feudalism, you know, where you have debt slaves. I posted a couple of those articles on the blog. If that's the way that they want to roll and that they want to do things, and that's the direction that they're pushing, you need to push back in the other direction. If you can do it, if you can possibly do it, stay out of debt. Right. Especially for the foolish stuff. I mean, if you have to you know, if you're in a situation where somebody lost a job and, you know, you, you've got to put some food on the credit card, hey, you got to eat. I, I get it. You know, I'm not trying to be some, you know, idealistic twerp here. But this foolish stuff that we tend to buy, the stuff that we don't really need, right. that we just, you know, there's a, a craze. We want it, so we have to have it. So we borrow money. Stop it. That kind of stuff. Stop it. Yeah. Get rid of it. If you're in debt, Figure out a way, to, you know, a program. Even if you're chipping away at it, twenty-five dollars a week. Move it around if you can. Yeah. To try to create a situation where you can knock the principal down, get yourself out of debt because right. that is that's poison right there. It's poison for the country. You know, we're seeing it. You know, we're, we're long past. You know, an actual number of eighteen trillion now. I mean, that that's going. Yeah, it's going right right through the roof. You know, you start figuring in, you know, all these unfunded, you know, going out periods of time. You know, you're talking huge amounts of money. It's poison. You know, if it's not going to work for the nation, if it's not going to work for the government, if it's not going to work for, you know, all, all these entities, it certainly isn't going to work for the little guy. So don't do it. And it's hard because we've been conditioned that it's okay. Well, do you, you know, think we've been, that we've they... been trained that? Hey, it's okay to have debt. Hey, you're a kid, you're going to college, you're going to come out with fifty, sixty thousand dollars in debt. Jeez, we're being trained right from teenager right. on. That drives me nuts when I. Hey, hear we'll that. give you a credit card while you're in college, so you That's can right. go and buy the latest eye junk along with the rest of the, you know, the kids <laughs> in your college. You know, and, the, and no, I'm being serious. No, the I ones know. That come out of college right. with credit card debt are coming out with five, six thousand dollars. Yeah, well, I know some young fellows who are out of college received a degree in some subject which really wasn't very specific. And um, they admit to me that they are, they never thought they'd be this way, but they are clinically depressed because they can never see themselves ever, till the day they die, be out of debt. Because they're so heavily in debt now, and it's not getting any better. And since it's difficult for them to retire the debt, if ever, and they keep on adding to debt to live, uh, they, they're, they're clinically depressed. Young people, clinically depressed because mm -hmm. of debt. Absolutely. And it's sad. Absolutely. It's sad. I talked to Absolutely many of them sad. that yeah. are in that boat. Unbelievable. Yeah. 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 Well, if you have a kid that's college age or coming up on college age, you need to sit that kid down and have some very serious conversations. If that kid has no idea what they want to do, do not send them to college. All you're doing is, is putting this gigantic hook in their mouth right. from the establishment. Because once they have them on that hook, it is really, really hard to get them off. And, and what's worse, what, what adds to, adding to that, you have a false expectation. 
Well, now that I have a college education, uh, companies will be Somebody just begging me, job. you know, yeah. to work, and they'll they'll start me at fifty four thousand a year and with with benefits, uh -huh. and they don't realize <laughs> that most companies are not hiring. They, they don't, and and the degree now is uh, having a college education is less than a high school education back in the nineteen fifties. So it, the, oh the world gosh, has yeah. changed. I mean, changed dramatically. And you're and you're and you're yeah, and you're paying through the nose for it. Right. You know, if you, if you have, you know, if you have a kid, you know, say the kid wants, I don't know, be, I, I, I pick on, not pick on, I kind of laud geology uh, as a good field because most of the, you know, you look at the demographics of geologists. You know, a lot of the guys are older, women, they're older, you know, they're going to, you know, be hanging it up soon. You can't traipse around these places, you know, 70 years of age. I mean, some of them do, but, you know, most of them, you know, they're ready to hang it up. There's not a lot of people going into the field. Yeah. That's a great field. If you, you know, if you have a kid that wants to do that and, is, and, and the kid's bright and all that stuff, you know what, that's, that's a, a thing that will probably pay off. Do your research. You know, yeah, granted, kids get to college, sometimes they change their mind. Well, I thought I wanted to do this, but you know, I really want to do that instead. If it, you, you need to do your research. If that's a, a dead-end degree, then there's no point in having it. Right. There's no, you're not adding any value your marketability as an employee just by having a degree anymore that's, right. that's yeah. a myth yeah that, that that's a it's a myth that's cooked up by these these sycophants at these colleges because they want to keep their rosters full yeah yeah so oh, you yeah. have to have a degree to succeed in america yeah. no you don't yeah. uh you could be a welder a plumber that's an right. electrician yeah. a mechanic there's a ton of jobs out there that you don't need a degree for and you can make a very nice living. You know, several Even years, today. Several years ago, I asked the gal that um, she, she never impressed me as being a particularly good student. In fact, she was a very poor student, and I hadn't seen her in years, and, and we were having, um, we met her at a restaurant, and uh, we sat down, we talked for a while, a young girl. And um, she says, well, I, I, you know, I, and, and she told us that she graduated with a master's degree in business, you know, business something or other. A man, I said, wow. I yeah, said, they hand those out like, I like said, candy now. well, what are you going to do with it? She says, I don't know. I said, well, are you going to go in business? She says, I wouldn't know how to do it, go to business. And she has a master's degree in business, and she was totally <laughs> clueless as to what to do with it. I said, well, what would you do it for? She said, well, you know, my husband was in the Army, and then I get so much money for going to school and this and that. So she just took the classes, and she got a degree, and she – it was amazing. She had, she had no interest in business. She had no idea what to do with it, and and if she had an interest in business, she would have no idea how to apply what she learned in school. <laughs> so I said, talking about a just an absolute waste of time and money is unbelievable. Well, Andy, we're about out of time. Once again, we chewed up a whole hour, but it was worthwhile. And I, again, I apologize for all the mechanical, the electronic problems or whatever we had to get you on the line. And I'm, I'm awfully glad that you, we do have one call on the line. We have a minute. Let's see if this caller has anything to say. All right, hold on, please. Caller, you're on the sure. line. Caller, you're on Hello, the line. Hello, this is Sarah. Sarah, yes, Hi, Sarah. We got three Sarah minutes. Yes, we got from three. Broken Arrow. Sarah from Broken and, Arrow. Um, I had a few questions, but we don't have much time for them. Right. But I just want to thank you so much, Joe, for your wonderful program. Thank you. And thank you, Andy, for coming on it. And I always learn so much. So I appreciate that. Well, I'm glad you guys are listening and, and getting something out of this. It's good to hear. Thank, thank you. you. Absolutely. Thank you. And I hope you come back soon. <laughs> well, we will. As long as Joel have it. <laughs> <laughs> What's your question, Good. Sarah? Do you have a question? Oh, if I have time for it. Yeah, one well, question. this has to do with you were talking about the uh, students that are going to school and the young people. Well, I had one daughter just graduate, and she got a degree, and now she's thinking about going to get her master's because really a lot of times when they get paid for things with a basic degree it's almost the same as if they had just gotten a job right out of high school and so now they're wanting a lot of young people feel like they have to get their master's degree if they want to make any kind of a living that they can have a you know a normal basic living and so how do you what would you say to a lot of these young people that are feeling like 
now I got to get my master's. Well, here's the thing, you know what. First of all, you have to look at what the student or the prospective student wants to do. You know, if they, you can do the research and find. All right, I, I want to be. You know, I, and I'm, I'm having a hard time thinking of a college-related career. I want to be a computer programmer. I use that as an example. All right, you can go and do research. How much? How much can I expect to make with a bachelor's degree? How much is that bachelor's degree going to cost me? Does it matter where I go to school? Do I have to go to a traditional school, or can I do it via a less expensive distance learning program? You know, a lot of these places, and I'll use myself as an example. I got an MBA back in 2002. I, I did the classroom method. And, you know, for that particular field, unless you're going to go to Wall Street, you know, or, you know, be in one of these, you know, top-tier settings, it doesn't really matter where you get it from. So there's no point in spending, say, $50,000 for that degree when you can spend fifteen. So that's the kind of questions you have to be asking and the research you have to be doing. You know, if you're looking at somebody who wants to be a programmer, all right, what's it going to cost? Where can I go? Does it matter if I do it this way versus that way? You can have a lot of those questions answered uh, just by doing some simple research. And then you find the path that's going to get you the best job for the best money at the lowest cost. And we're not doing that today as a society. We're just saying, oh, I want to go to, you know, I don't know, ABC State, so I'm just going to go there, and I'll figure out what I want to do when I get there. And a lot of these kids are coming out with all this debt, and, you know, they have a degree that's not going to earn them a wage that's commensurate with the amount of debt that they took on to do it. You know, college is a business decision, and we have to start treating it like one. Yep. And, Sarah, let me add okay, something to that. Okay, that's good information. Sarah, let me add something to that before we – we're running late, but let me add something to that. Um, I think someone must really recognize what they – feel that they want to do and what they're capable of doing. Um, I have encouraged more young men to go to um, the uh, Oklahoma uh, Technical Institute here in, in Mulkey, Oklahoma, who has the, that has the best um, diesel mechanics uh, course probably in the nation, where uh, wow. diesel manufacturing uh, uh, manufacturers like Detroit Diesel, Cummins, and what those fly in on, a, on their Grumman jets every year and pick up students and fly them to their factories and they will start the students out, start them. This is, a, this is by the way, this was a couple of years ago at $55,000 a year. Now, I, I defy anybody to tell me, you know, I challenge anyone to tell me if they, they get an MBA in business starting at $55,000 a year anywhere. So sometimes we say we need a college education in order to get a good job. That's not always true. It's true in, in certain instances, but when they go to college for the sake of going to college to get a degree, they're, they're going, to, going to be on the losing end of the stick. I'd rather see someone become a good diesel mechanic or diesel engineer or whatever. They, now, if they want to be a diesel engineer, they may have to go to a different school and then go, go to, a, go to a, 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 a trade school. But in that case, they become an expert in their field and they're worth the fortune. And it's also where they live. A lot of people want to live in nice places like New York City where it's exciting, where an apartment may cost them $12,000 a month where if that same person decided for a few years to live in North Dakota or, or maybe even Alaska, they may make double the amount of money at half the expense, save enough money to go in business for themselves. There are these options that we don't talk about and parents don't discuss with their children any longer. It's like, you know, Johnny, go to school, get good grades. When you graduate, goodbye, you're out of the house. And then Johnny's out there with his friend, living with his friends, you know, smoking pot, having a great time, not making any money. Or, but, or, they're, or even worse, they're not out of the house. Yeah, that's right. Even that's, worse, they're in the basement. That's thing can, too, can't get Johnny out of the basement, you know. So it really is. It's it's a multifaceted question, and and we have to look at it overall, and we have to get out of our heads that a college education is your key to a better life. It ain't true. Just ain't true anymore. You know, you know, Joe. It almost reminds me of Paul's and. You know, when he was Secretary of the Treasury, hey, how you, uh, you'd ask him a question, and his answer would be, a strong dollar is in the national interest. It was almost like, you know, it was programmed. That's right. That's the way we, that's the way we look at this whole situation yeah. with colleges. 
and stuff like that. And then when you think about what were you guys talking about college for? This is an economics program. You're talking. This is how you start out is more than likely going to be how you finish out. That's right. If you start and get conditioned to accept debt, these guys know that. Why do you think they feed credit cards to 17 and 18 year old kids? Because they know if they can get them hooked early, they're going to have them hooked for life more often than not. Yeah. This is important stuff. These are important decisions. You know, and you made you, you made a very good point there. I have a friend whose whose son is actually going to one of these technical institutes. He's a bright kid. He's not college material. He knows it. And guess what? He's going to make a ton of money because he's acing this program, and he's going to end up probably working for like a Mercedes or a BMW or somebody like that as a mechanic, yeah. and he's going to make big bucks. And, and some of them that specialize make six-figure incomes, and they're, yeah. and they're in demand. You know, going to college today, saying I'm going to go, 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 go to college today, is like saying I'm going to go into the uh, uh, buggy whip business. <clears throat> you know, it's obsolete. It, it no longer yeah. applies. I mean, you can become an expert buggy whip uh, uh, manufacturer. Ain't no one going to buy it. And no one's going to buy your degree today. That's the way I look at it. Well, so that, we're, almost at, we're almost totally out of time. We're going to lose our time on the air, and we're going to get cut off oh. whether we like it or not. Sarah, thank you so much for calling in. We certainly appreciate oh. your comments and your calling in and your interest. And good thank luck you, to you. Thank you, Sarah. Good talking. Thank right. you. Right. It was I'm, a great call. I appreciate it. Bye-bye. All right, Andy, would you like to just sum things up and tell people if they, uh, where they can reach you if you want them to reach you or your, your, about your, uh, uh, your podcast and, and uh, My Two Cents and stuff like that? Yeah, all of that material, it's still at sutton-associates.net on the web, uh, www.sutton-associates.net. And that may be moving, but for now it's going to stay there. The problem is I, all these articles that I've written over the last umpteen years are hard linked there. So if I move them to a different place, all the links that people have out on the internet are going to break. Right. So I almost have to keep. I almost have to keep the stuff there. Yeah. So it, I, I think it's probably going to remain there uh, for a while. There, you know, all, all the two cent stuff is there. Uh, I've got to rearrange some things, and you know, there's a blog. You can find all of it there, and you can you can get the information and, and subscribe and, and all that kind of stuff. And the, the two cents is free. We do. I'm still doing the sensible investor. Uh, switched it over to a, a donation so, you know, to support the cost of the bandwidth and you know hosting fees and uh, you know, data subscriptions and that kind of stuff. So okay. if people feel like Very they good. want to make a contribution, uh, I ask twenty bucks for a year, and you get four issues of that. And, if you don't feel like that, hey, that's fine. Read the two cents. Get what you can out of it. That's why it's there. Okay, folks, go to uh, Sutton-Associates.net and subscribe. And give them your 20 bucks or else, or you'll have to answer to me. How about that? Uh-oh. The <laughs> <spoken>. <laughs> Andy, thank you so much for being on our program. I hope you'll accept our invitation to return the third Thursday of next month. Absolutely, Joe. I'm sure we'll have more interesting stuff to talk about. <laughs> right. Thank you so much for being on our show. Appreciate it. All Bye right. Now. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Uh, geez, well, that was a great program. That was a great, great program. I just, uh, Andy Sutton is my favorite, I'll tell you. Him, uh, Andy Sutton, Gerald Salente, uh, Peter Schiff, there's a whole bunch of them, but uh, he's one of my favorites. I really enjoy. Uh, Gotta be careful what I say. This is the end of tonight's today's program, but we'd like to thank our sponsors for their financial support. We'd like to thank you for listening in. Folks, you can further the cause of liberty by recommending this program to your friends and let us hear from you. Our email address is comments at libertytalkradio.com. Remember, you're either allowing your liberty to be taken away or you're striving to protect them. Unfortunately, folks, there is no middle ground. With that, until next time, I'm Joe Crispiano. This is Liberty Talk Radio. Stay well. Stay tuned.